Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Wednesday night class studying Parashat HaShavua. This Torah portion is Parashat Mishpatim. And we're going to thank tonight's sponsors. A big thank you to Michael and Ayelet Dahan, who are sponsoring tonight's class in honor of their beautiful baby daughter, Imuna Esther, who was born a couple months ago. They want to show their appreciation and their gratitude uh, to us and uh, therefore they're sponsoring tonight's class. So big mazel tov, and thank you very much. We are now starting with Reb Ari Leib Heyman, and I think this is going to change not only this week when we read Shabbat, this chidush, but this is going to change the way you celebrate every single holiday from here on in. So I think it's definitely worthwhile listening to this, because as we learned from last week's parasha, I tell you personally, my Shabbat prayers were different last week than ever before. Because every single one of the prayers, Arvit, and then Shachrit, then Musaf, and then Mincha, I had a different concentration, a different intention during the Amidah. I even made for myself shorthanded notes of each one, of what I should have in mind for each one. And they're in Hebrew, they're little squiggles. I'll try to help you guys and, and share them with you, but but they they really, really are able to help you refocus what you're doing, when you're doing it, and make it meaningful. And that's what tonight's class is going to do for us, hopefully, for the holidays. But it's not just going to be like, oh, a chair at the top. Cherry at the top of a cake is always the best part, right? But if there's no cake, there's no point of that cherry. So we're going to build up to that cherry and show you the divine wisdom there is in our Torah and the great gift the world was given, Rabbi Ari Leib Heyman, to bring this, this insight to us. This is his own chidush, his own novelty, and wow, if I may say so, absolutely genius. So let's understand that we have three main holidays throughout our year. That is Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, Passover, Shavuot and Sukkot. It's funny, Passover is the only one that has a uh, translation. But anyways, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Those are th our three main holidays. Now, if we go through our Torah in its entirety, there are five mentions of our holidays in our Torah. The first one, no coincidence, being in this week's Torah portion. The second, that's Parashat Mishpatim. The second one is in Parashat Kitisa. It's going to be in a couple weeks from now, after the sin of the golden calf. Then in the book of Leviticus in Parashat Emor, again, we have the mention of our holidays. The fourth time is in Parashat Bamidbar, in, in Sefer Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, Parashat Pinchas. And then a last time in the book of Deuteronomy in Parashat Re'eh, as a part of Moses' review of the entire Torah. So again, Mishpatim, Kitisa, Emor, Pinchas, and Re'eh. Five times in our Torah, the holidays are mentioned. So, as all of our study always entails, whenever there is something that is being repeated in our Torah, we obviously need to know why that is. We understand the Word of God as a divine calculation and a very meaningful one every word every letter so if it's being repeated five times well we got to know why that is being done that's firstly secondly Rebleib wants to know that in parashat kitisa that's in a couple weeks from now after the sin of the golden calf not only is there a review of our holidays and their laws but there's also a, a review of some other integral laws and he wants to know why. Meaning, I understand we, we didn't answer yet, but we're going to understand why there is a need to review or to have repeated the holidays, not once, not twice, yet five times. But the second time it's being repeated, that's in Parashat Kitisa in the book of Exodus. Why is it that not only the holidays are being repeated, but other integral laws that were given at Mount Sinai were also repeated? So in order to answer these first two questions, again, why there's so many repetitions, and again, why was there a repetition of other laws, 
Leib quotes for us the Nachmanides, the Ramban. The Ramban explains that in Parashat Mishpatim, that's in this week's Torah portion, it was the very first time the holidays are being commanded to the Jewish people. Again, remember, they were just a few weeks ago had their exodus. They were taken out of Egypt. They're about to be given the Torah. Sorry, sorry, make a mistake, wrong. The Torah was given, right? Already Parashat Yitro, last week's Torah portion. The Torah was given and Hashem, while giving the Torah, is telling us of these holidays, these three main holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. This is the very first time. However, we know that only 40 days after receiving the Torah, the Jewish people sinned by worshiping the golden calf. And that explains the Ramban, the Nachmanides, that ruined the level of holiness and connection that we had with our Creator. And when, Ash, and, and when Moshe Rabbeinu smashed the tablets, it's as if the covenant that the Jewish people with, that had with God was completely voided. Done. So when Hashem came to forgive the Jewish people and gave them the second tablets, that was the mark of a new covenant explains the Ramban. So again, very high level. It was ruined after the, after, after the sin of the golden calf. But then when God forgives us, he gives us a new covenant between the two of us. And that's the explanation. And that's the reason why Reb Leib says that in Parashat Ki Tisa, during the second time, the second mention of the three holidays, it is being told to us because we are renewing some basic laws. We are renewing the holidays, which is bringing us back into the relationship with Hashem. If we did not have that horrible event of the golden calf, we would not need for this. So therefore, the first time in this week's Torah portion, we understand why we need that. That is because it's the first time we're being told about the holidays. The second time, which is in a couple of weeks from now in the Parashat of Kitisa, that's after the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. And now Hashem is re-giving us the holidays along with some other basic laws to reinstate, to, to re reforge this covenant that we once had and now we are reinstating again. That's the reason for the second time. So now, fine, that makes sense. The first two. What's the reason for the third, the fourth, and the fifth? The Leviticus. It's mentioned in the book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy. So in the book of Leviticus, in Parashat Imor, the reason why the holidays are being mentioned again for a third time is because this is the first time that all the holidays are being recorded, including Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were not mentioned before. And... There's a specific difference that the Torah there mentions, and his Mechadesh gives us this new halacha, that there's a difference between Shabbat and Yom Kippur versus the rest of the holidays, i.e. Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Shavuot, and Pesach. What's the difference? The difference is based on the vernacular, the way the Torah says to cease from all work. I want to share with you the verse. Okay, the verse is in chapter 23. Did I put it on? One second. Uh... Give me a second here. Chapter 23, verses 3 and 31. I know I pulled them out. Chapter 23, verses. Oh, okay. Here we go. What happened here? Here we go. Okay. Sorry for that. Sheshet yamim teasim elacha. This is talking about Shabbat, as well as, as Yom Kippur. Six days you shall perform work. Six days you shall perform work. On the seventh day should be a complete rest, and you cannot perform any work. Fine. This terminology of kol melacha lo ta'asu, that seems like 
any type of work, any type of prohibited work on Shabbat, you're not allowed. Let's now fast forward to when the other holidays are being mentioned. This is Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, and Rosh Hashanah. This is in chapter 23, verse 31. So, uh, again, the difference is, as Reb Leib explains, is that by oh sorry so that's by Russia but that's by Shabbat and Yom Kippur it says kol melacha lotasu however when it comes to Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot the Torah does not say kol melacha lotasu it says kol melechet avoda lotasu it adds the extra word I didn't put bring up that verse sorry it's in the book of Leviticus also meaning any type of work that's avoda you cannot do. From there, learns the Talmud that on Rosh Hashanah and Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot, you're allowed to cook. But on Shabbat and Yom Kippur, you're not allowed to cook. So again, going back to the reason why Pashat Emor for a third time, all the holidays are being renewed, are being said again, is in order to tell us that there's a difference between Shabbat and Yom Kippur compared to the rest of the holidays. Now, why do we need it to be repeated for a fourth time in the book of Numbers in pa- the end of Parashat Pinchas? That's in order to tell us what are the appropriate sacrifices for each of the holidays. That's it. Simple. What's the sacrifices? Now, the fifth time it's being mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy in Parashat Re'eh, this is right before the Jewish people are entering the land of Israel. And Moshe Rabbeinu is not only recounting the entire Torah, renewing it, reviewing it with them, but it's also telling us that there's a special mitzvah of pilgrimage, aliyah la regel, that you have to, during the holidays, when the time of the Beit HaMikdash was, was in, in full operation, every Jew was supposed to come and pay homage to the Beit HaMikdash, come and visit it and bring korbanot. And in order for us to know that, the Torah had to repeat it again a fifth time. Not only that, it's also there to teach us that in the land of Israel, even though when we enter the land of Israel, it's so holy, we're not allowed to just bring sacrifices anywhere we want. It has to be Hashem, in the place that Hashem chose for his Shekhinah, his presence to dwell, which is specifically in the temple, in the Bet HaMikdash. There's other laws of, of the korbanot, of the, of the sacrifices in Jerusalem then, but the reason for the fifth time that the Torah repeats the holidays is telling us in specific correlation to observing the holidays in the land of Israel. So that answers those two questions of why specifically is the Torah repeating so many times the holidays in our Torah once could have been enough, but rather we just explained why we needed it five times. Now is when it gets interesting. Reb Leib then says, after a deep analysis of the holidays and the way the Torah presents the holidays to us, he says there are two holidays that their name changes from the original name the Torah introduced that holiday to us as. Sounds interesting. So in Parashat Mishpatim, in this week's Torah portion, the Torah calls the second and third holiday a certain way. Again, we're referring to when I say second and third, that's Shavuot and Sukkot. How does the Torah refer to those holidays as? Take a look at your screen. Chapter 23, verse 16. So, by the way, it refers to the first holiday, the holiday of Pesach, as Chal HaMatzot, the holiday of our Matzah. Okay, we'll explain why in a moment. Then it says, Vechag HaKatsir, and the festival of our harvest, Bikurei Maasecha Asher Tizra Basateh. Then Vechag HaAsif, the festival of our gathering. So here we see that the Torah is calling the second and third holiday, not Shavuot and Sukkot, rather the holiday of gathering. So the holiday of our harvest and the holiday of our gathering. What's fine. That, that's, that's one. Now let's go look in Parashat. Kitisa, 
In Parashat Kiti Sa, the Torah switches it on us. The Torah doesn't call Chag HaKatsir the holiday of our harvest. It goes on to call it as Chag Ha Shavuot. Don't take my word for it. Exodus chapter 34, verse 22. When it refers to the holidays, it switches Chag HaKatsir to Chag Shavuot, but it keeps the holiday of our gathering as the holiday of our gathering. It doesn't switch it yet to Sukkot. Then in the third time the Torah mentions by Parashat Emor in the book of Leviticus, it says for the first time, Basukot Teshevu Shivat Yamim. So what is going on over here? Firstly, we need to understand why is the Torah changing these holiday names? If the holiday is called Shavuot, call Shavuot from the get-go. If the holiday is called Sukkot, why are you waiting two parshas to tell us about that? That's one issue. Second issue is, we even see that the changing is not cohesive. We see that in the second time it's mentioned, Shavuot's changed, but not Sukkot. And then only the third time are all three cha- or all two changed. We finally have Sukkot named as Sukkot. What's the reason for this? Before answering this, Reb Leib wants to share with us another insight that's going to help us answer this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to conclude everything at the end. I'm going to review all of the questions and answers so we have it all clear. But I think it's absolutely fascinating what he did with this piece. Reb Leib says, when we look at Parashat Emor, that's the third mention of our, of our holidays in the Torah, we see that after the Torah changes the name of the holiday of Chag HaAsif to Chag HaSukot, it changes it, but instead of telling us why it made that name change, as it did by Shavuot, the reason why it changes it for Shavuot is because you count seven weeks after Passover, and that's when Shavuot is. So the Torah should have told us, well, we changed the name to Sukkot because so you should remember that your ancestors sat in Sukkot's while they were traveling in the desert. No, it doesn't tell us that. It first goes on, it tells us, change name to Sukkot, and then it gives us other, other mitzvot, like the uh, korbanot, the sacrifices that were brought all on that holiday, that you're not allowed to do any work, the four, the four species that we hold, the, the lulav and etrog, all things. And then it goes and tells us, leman yidudorotechem. It goes and tells us, you sit in Sukkot for seven days in order that you remember that your ancestors traveled in Sukkot. Why did Torah do that? Why would the Torah mix up the order and not stay in the same way that it mentioned the reason? You, you, you're changing something, you're changing the name. Give me the reason before you're giving me other laws for that holiday. So Reb Leib gives a fascinating answer to explain all these questions. And he says, we have to remember that when the Jewish people received the Torah at Mount Sinai, as we read about in last week's Torah portion, they were lifted to an extremely high spiritual level, to that level that Adam Harishon was before he ate from the tree of knowledge. We're talking like speckless, perfect. They were supposed to stay at that level forever, and they were never, ever even supposed to die. However... When they sinned and they worshipped the golden calf, they dropped back to the level they were before, and they were going to die like every other human being. There wasn't anything they could do about it. Since B'nai Israel were on that such a high level right after Matan Torah, right after the receiving of the Torah, listen to this. This is the biggest part. It would have been enough for the Jewish people to celebrate. Reb Leib says one holiday day a year to celebrate and commemorate our exodus of Egypt by eating matzah one time a year. No need to have the celebration for as every holiday. One time, Pesach, that's it. You know what the additional holidays were intended to be? The additional holidays were there as a seasonal expression of gratitude and thanksgiving to Hashem. And that's why they were called 
based on their farmer needs of the time of the year of harvesting, which is around seven weeks after Passover, and the time of the year of their gathering, which is two weeks after Rosh Hashanah. The Jews were at such a high level by Matan Torah that instilling in them our core belief as Jews that Hashem took us from slavery as his own nation, one holiday a year would have been good enough. Dayenu, as we say. However, after they sinned, and they committed the sin of the golden calf. Everything changed from there on. Their level not only dropped, but they now also were going to die like every other human being. Hashem did forgive the Jewish people based on Moshe's continuous supplication for them. But there was still a scar. And the Jewish people were taken back by Hashem and lifted but not to the same level Reb Leib explains as they were at before, before the sin. Before, when they were at Mount Sinai. And now one sin, sorry, not one sin, one holiday to commemorate, to, 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 to remember and to celebrate for the Exodus would not suffice. Pesach in and of itself would not be enough to instill in the Jewish people the memory of the Exodus. They now needed more than that. And therefore, the other holidays were no longer going to be just genuine or generic, rather, would be the word generic Thanksgiving holidays. They were going to be specific to remembering and thanking Hashem for the exodus, for taking us out of Egypt, that they would now be a continuation to the Pesach holiday. And so it is. In Parashat Kitisa, when the holidays are continued, are, are repeated, Shavuot is just referred to, as, the, by the way, the name Shavuot is not even said. It just says seven weeks after Passover, no specific date, because it's just a continuation of Passover. If we look at every single one of our Kiddushes, not only on Passover do we say to remember leaving Egypt, on Shavuot and also on Sukkot we say because from after the sin of the golden calf, Rebleib says that the consequence of the sin of the golden calf did manifest also in the holidays, that now every single holiday will remind us that Hashem took us out of Egypt to reinstill and to to strengthen our core belief in god so now we have to ask ourselves well why wasn't chag ha'asif the gathering holiday which we know is changed to sukkot why wasn't that changed the second time the holidays were mentioned why did it wait till the third time the holidays were mentioned in parashat imor fair question Reb Leib explains that the Talmud teaches us that after the sin of the golden calf, the Shekhinah, Hashem's presence, would no longer dwell in our homes as it was supposed to be. Because that sin, as we said, did put up a wall between us and Hashem. But after Hashem forgave the Jewish people on Yom Kippur, and His mercy overcame His judgment... Hashem then commanded us to put up a house, a temporary house, right next to our homes. And that he will join us in there for seven days every year. We know this house to be called the sukkah. But now where in the Torah is Yom Kippur mentioned for the first time? In Parashat Emor, in the third time that the Torah mentions to us the holidays. Because that's timeline-wise after the sin of the golden calf, after Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu are going back and forth, fine. Now he finally forgave us. He gave the Jewish people Yom Kippur. That's when it's mentioned for the first time. That's why that third time when the holidays are mentioned is the first time that Sukkot 
is now being is Chag HaAsif is being changed to Chag HaSukot because that was the first time that Hashem was able to forgive the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf and now join them in their sukkah as a one-on-one. There is, however, and this is how Herbleib ends off, there is another condition for Hashem's Shekhinah to join us in our sukkah, and that is Simcha, joy and happiness. And specifically, Simcha Shel Mitzvah, the joy of fulfilling a mitzvah, the feeling that there is no greater one of Simcha, of happiness, while fulfilling or after fulfilling a good deed. And therefore, right after the Torah changes the name from Chag Hasif to Chag Sukkot, it doesn't go and explain the mitzvahs of the sukkah are the reason behind the sukkah. It goes and tells us other mitzvahs, the mitzvah of the, the sacrifices and the other mitzvahs of the holiday and the four species. Why? Because it's alluding to our victory that we had on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur when we had a positive judgment. And then what's the next thing we do after that? We break out in doing a mitzvah and through that simcha of the mitzvah, the happiness of fulfilling that mitzvah, rejoicing with those mitzvahs, then we are now able to go and invite the Shekhinah, Hashem's presence, in our sukkah. So I want to sum this all up. I want to make a quick conclusion on all this because he spoke about a lot of important things, but I want to tie it all together. The first thing we learned is that each time the Torah repeated to us the holidays, there was a specific reason for that. The reason was that every single time the Torah was teaching us something new. What were they? Well, the first time was just to mention the Torah, the the holidays. The second time was to re-mention them after the sin of the golden calf, along with other mitzvahs, to reinstate that bond, that covenant we have with Hashem. The third time was the first time that the Torah tells us about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and mentions all the holidays all at once and how Yom Kippur and Shabbat are different than the other holidays. The fourth time was just to mention to us the different sacrifices, appropriate sacrifices being brought on the holidays. And the fifth time it was mentioned to us as the last um, time the Torah reviews the the entire Torah along with the holidays and specific laws for them while entering the land of Israel. So that was the first thing we spoke about, how it's very deliberate and specific every single holiday that was mentioned and five times, not only once, yet five times. Then, after the sin of the golden calf, Hashem had to retell us other laws along in order to renew his bond. The third thing we spoke about is how two of the three holidays' names were changed, and they each had a specific purpose, and that purpose that was just originally supposed to be a thanksgiving and expression of gratitude to Hashem for blessing our land with great produce and food, obviously, that purpose changed after the sin of the golden calf. Because when the Jewish people dropped, now they had to reinfuse and make the point of our exodus more than once a year. It wasn't enough that it would be just on Passover. It had to be multiple times. So it all changed. Now it would be Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. And the fourth thing that we spoke about is that through the Simcha Shel Mitzvah, the rejoicing to fulfilling a mitzvah, is the way to welcome Hashem into our sukkah, into our lives, into us. And I think this piece is a fundamental piece that every Jew needs to know. We need to know, number one, that the sin of the golden calf had real ramifications. Ramifications that even though after we were forgiven for those for that sin as a Jewish people, there was still a scar. And that's number one. We have to realize that when we do something wrong, and even though we, re, we, we, we repent for it and we atone for it, it is never the way it was before. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't atone and repent for it, because like we all know, if someone busts their head open and they survive with a scar, they're very grateful for that. At least they're able to survive. However, from the get-go beforehand, we should know that when we play with sharp things, when we mess around with things that Hashem does not want us to sin with and mess with, that there could be severe damage and scars that come from that. That's number one. 
Number two is, is that we have to really, really understand, and this Rabbi um, Israel Mayer, when he was studying with me this week, he came up with this, this idea. I think it's beautiful. We all know now, and we kind of always knew, because we've spoken about this multiple times, that every holiday is Zecher Litzet Mitzrayim. Every holiday is to remember Mitzrayim. But only now do we understand that that was not Hashem's original plan. That was post sin of golden calf. Hashem's original plan was Passover is to remember leaving Egypt. And the other two holidays were opportunities for us to thank God for the blessing and the abundance and the success he gave us. So this is what Rabbi Israel Mayer said as a takeaway is that we should pay attention that on Shavuot and Sukkot specifically, we should not forget and not have, not be missing that original intention of God of that being a holiday to thank Hashem. So specific intentions on Shavuot and Sukkot to express our gratitude and thanks to Hashem for the livelihood that He provides for us. And the fourth thing to mention is that magic ingredient of simcha, of joy and happiness, which wherever we sprinkle it, it brings a tremendous amount of positive energy and great success. It's one that should not be overlooked. When a person is happy and they're sameach bechelko and they're happy with their lot, with their portion, whether right now it's sweet or spicy or sour or bitter, it does not matter. When we realize that everything Hashem gives us is for our good and we're happy with that and we are accepting of that, that simcha will manifest and attract other great, happy, and sweet occasions and successes in our life. It's very hard to let go and to just accept sometimes. But in other times, that's kind of the only way to cope through different pain that we are enduring by literally giving up. Not giving up in a way like we throw in the towel, but just giving up and saying, I can't fight against this. There's a certain force. There's God that wants something to happen a certain way. And once you accept it, everything will flow. And maybe the closing of that door will open up another five doors. And maybe the end of this specific topic in your life or relationship in your life may be the opening to other venues in your life. And therefore, when we have simcha, and when we have great joy in fulfilling mitzvot, that is something that infuses us with a tremendous amount of power in order to conquer anything that may be as an obstacle and really strive and thrive over, over anything. I always like to say, we're not here to survive, we're rather here to strive. Anyone can survive. We're not here to survive. We want to we wanna thrive and strive way over anyone else's expectations. We want to outdo ourselves. We want to be the greatest we can possibly be. So those were the takeaways from this great, great, uh, great novelty from, from Rabbi Leib Heyman. Please re-listen to this class. There's a lot of gems. I really tried to concise it. Go back and open the Chumash. Check the verses out. And I'd be more than happy if anyone wants me to email them or, or text them the, the verses. I have tons. I, I, I put them all out. I have a whole document with them. So it would be my pleasure to share them.